through Report Confusion campaign, uh, payload could, can be anything because you are literally running their code, their malicious code in, their, in your own infrastructure, in your own applications. So there is no limit to what can be the payload. No, whatsoever. They can do anything, just code running on your machine directly, no limitations, and nothing is checking it. This is why it made so much noise. Hi, this is Yohosapil Bhartia and welcome to TFI Let's Talk. Today we have with us Matan Giladi, security researcher at Apiro. Matan, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, Swapneo. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about uh, your research team recently found a malicious repo confusion campaign which impacts over like 100,000 GitHub repos. So there is so much to unpack here. So let's start, you know, step by step. Number one is that when and how you found about this campaign? So we found about it a month ago, a bit more. Um, naturally, as a company that does deep code analysis, we have a curiosity and a lot of motivation to test different approaches and techniques in detection of code. And when we scan open source, that's huge amounts of code that we can check our things on. And when it's also this topic, then it means that we can expand it to very interesting security research. What exactly is confusion campaign? A repo confusion is an attack type. That means that you upload a repository that impersonates a different repository or uh, embotinates, you can say, because it's exactly the same code. And as an attacker, you clone it, you add your malicious payload inside of it, you infect it with malware practically, and then you re-upload it with the same name. Now, when naive users are looking for this repository or anything that would fulfill their current need, then um, it might be difficult for them to distinguish between the real one and the fake one. So once they make the mistake, they download the fake repository and the malicious code executes on their machines. What is the purpose? What is the malicious goal uh, of these you know, attackers to you know, repo confusion campaign? Money, basically, like most of them. And the way they do it is by stealing all credentials that they can find inside of the browsers of the victims cookies, sessions, uh, credentials, and also um, crypto, uh, cryptocurrency wallets. And one of the things that the malware does is adding um, a binary executable to wallet applications. So they also try to steal money. When we talk about cyber attacks, we talk about, you know, oh, hey, this is the this is a cyber attack going on. This is the payload. You know, it could be ransomware. It could be, you know, credentials, you know, it could be money. So what I'm saying is that through repo confusion campaign, uh, payload could, can be anything because you are literally running their code, their malicious code in their in your own infrastructure, in your own applications. So there is no limit to what can be the payload. No, whatsoever. They can do anything, just code running on your machine directly, no limitations, and nothing is checking it. This is why it made so much noise. Of course, as you said, you know, more than 100,000 you know, repos were infected. But did you also find where attackers actually did you know, harm, where companies got affected, or you're, like, you're not hearing yet from companies if they get you know, affected by this uh, campaign? So I did find incidents. Um, naturally, uh, they did not want to be disclosed, but it definitely happened. And also some, after we published it, approached me and asked uh, for verification or for guidance because they realized that they downloaded these packages. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely happening. And also the hundred of thousand packages is what it, just what we found. Yeah, but... Um, originally, originally it was probably around, well, it was millions. We don't know the exact numbers because GitHub does eventually recognize automation of forking, fork bombs, uh, when the same repository is being forked thousands of times, but it takes time until they remove it. So when the campaign is running, it's much more than 100,000 uh, repositories. Do we know who were behind these attacks, these campaigns? So we have a suspect. We also mapped their uh, server. 
And I cannot say much about it because, you know, until it's not proven, then you should not uh, shame anyone. Um, but we have, uh, we're pretty sure we know who it is. How did they manage to inject the malicious, you know, code and, you know, also do the whole cloning repo on GitHub? So they took advantage of the fact that there is no awareness of this bridge possibility, of this attack vector. Not enough. I mean, most developers just blindly trust GitHub. It's became a de facto approach that you just look for the repository that does what you want and you clone it and that's it. Yeah. So, you know, you have to rely on um, EDR or similar products after deployment and in the build, uh, you know, m much later in the process to detect it. Um, so there is a huge hole here. Um, and anyone can just download a repository, put whatever they want in it and uh, upload it back. Yeah. So all that has to happen in order for the attack to work is that a user will make the mistake of picking the wrong repository. That's all. And some actors, we have also seen other attacks in a smaller scale where they employ social engineering to achieve that. Going back to the point of the importance of understanding when you're pulling a cloning a repository, you should know what code you're pulling in, what code is running in your application, what code is running in your infrastructure, how that could have mitigated the problem, how you feel that Yes, people do need to understand just like the assembly line, you know, you should know where the brakes or all the components of your cars are coming from. Well, you know, Swapnil, this is a very interesting point and a controversial one because one of the comments that co keeps on popping up regarding this type of issues is developers who say, well, good developers won't fall for it. You know, because a good developer checks everything and goes through all of the code and they will spot it. Yeah. But I've met brilliant developers who have done like much, you know, sillier mistakes than that. Practically no one. And I sign it. No one, <laughs> especially when you have when you're in a rush, you have a deadline, you know, will uh, read all of the code and the sub dependencies of the code. And it's just impossible. And so there's nothing, uh, we should not put the responsibility on the developers. This is what I'm saying. Like it's very good to be aware and it would be awesome if you can check everything that you install and download, but it can't be only, the, uh, the responsibility can't be only of the developer. So the platforms that we use, um, GitHub is amazing. It's an amazing service. Um, the whole tech world is relying on GitHub, but there is a reason why they are the only player. The other players um, didn't handle well this kind of issues. Um, SourceForge and alike who got filled with malware until it was impossible to trust anything from there. So it's a big responsibility and it's not trivial at all. It's not easy to solve this problem. If you're a GitHub, it's a very difficult issue to tackle, but it should come from there and it should come from infrastructure tools, such as automatic detection of malicious code, that every piece of code that gets to your any of your devices, servers, um, microservices, whatever, should have uh, should be scanned for malicious code. Okay, so let's talk about GitHub. Since you're saying the the big responsibility lies on the shoulders of GitHub, when you found about this uh, this campaign, did you folks? Of course, you did. Uh, talk to uh, GitHub. What was the response? What are they doing? And are you also involved in that process? Okay. So first they do a lot uh, regarding this kind of problems of malware on the uh, platform, but it's still, uh, the problem is too large to be fully solved in an easy way. 
they did invest a lot in a reporting mechanism and um, responding quickly. So, of course, we um, told them before we published it, um, but we didn't get a personal response or anything uh, far more than that. But it's also understandable as even that it's hundreds of thousands uh, thousand repositories that we found, it's still a uh, drop in the ocean when it comes to GitHub. It has hundreds of millions, maybe more. These days, yeah, it, uh, GitHub exploded with new repositories uh, in recent years, and it was huge even before. As you rightly said, you know, that when you look at GitHub, the scale that they operate, you know, millions and billions of repositories, also 100,000 may not be a big, you know, uh, it's like a drop in the ocean, but the, we don't know what kind of companies were affected by it. Um, what I do want to ensure is that irrespective of, you know, who you were, uh, what is the right approach so that whether uh, GitHub is doing, I'm pretty sure they are doing, but whether they are doing something or not, how organizations can protect themselves and how Apiro can go so that the developer teams, the way I look at security is that, you know, security teams, they build guardrails around developers. So it gives developers freedom to play with the code. They can pull repository. Otherwise, the innovation will be stifled because they will have to think 10 times before using any code base. So talk about the right approach, what companies are doing, what they can do, or how Apiro can help them to protect them from these kind of campaigns. There are three pillars to handling this situation. Um, first of all, there is no uh, perfect solution yet, unfortunately. So it's there are a few companies Apira is one of them that, well, we are developing it now, yeah, that uh, offer a malicious code detection service. So without something like that, that works properly, it would be very difficult to find such incident. Because in most of places, this is not happening currently, and this kind of service is not being used, then um, it falls back to two things. One is the awareness of the developers that should be very careful with what they download. Um, but again, you can't prevent all incidents like that. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is the general security posture of the organization, meaning if the environments are segregated and separated properly and there are security mechanisms um, you know, other security mechanisms such as, such as verif uh, verifying the integrity. And there are many mechanisms that supposed to prevent such code to get in production, for example. Not everyone, well, most companies don't deploy everything that they should, but such solutions exist. Uh, for example, Apiro would notify you about that. Um, and that's it, a scanning, the, uh, scanning service, awareness, and general security posture. Earlier, you were also saying that, you know, that from your point of view, you don't feel that developers should be responsible for that. But in the last couple of years, we have been talking a lot about shift lab, you know, a lot of things are moving into developers pipeline. You also talked about the awareness of developers, uh, which I think has more to do with another point that you made was the, the culture of the company, the posture that the company takes. So can you also talk about from that perspective as a research of security that what kind of practices companies should have? So even if there are tools from Epigro, a tool is as good as the user, you know, if the user is not deploying the tool properly, if not using the tool, tool is useless. So can you talk about that perspective? It's a very tricky one because you don't want to block, well, you know, it's a general, it, it's the usual conflict between development and security. Yeah, you don't want to block development and you can't rely on developers um, to be using, even if they're aware of security issues, you can't rely on them to use this knowledge all the time because they're focused on achieving whatever they try to achieve, which is not security, it's functions and systems. So. Um, such a solution would be an IDE extension and maybe a wrapper um, around the Git client. Um, these kind of solutions. Um, 
And mostly it would be great if you could use GitHub or any other platform while knowing that it's very rare to, f to encounter such thing, you know, that such, uh, that code is being removed more um, sharply when they have to, you know, when it has to, when it might be malicious. Now, since your blog post is there, this video is also there, there's a lot of awareness of it. How do companies find that whether they were also impacted or not? So there are several indicators of compromise. Um, there are parts, well, patterns in the payloads that repeat themselves, mostly around the exec function in Python that, well, it's self-explanatory uh, and also um, you can just like search for the string in your uh, entire system, um, not just exec, yeah, but you can see in the post I've detailed, uh, I've listed all um, strings that would lead you to these infected repositories if you clone them. And also you can check for um, the presence of malformed versions of the crypto applications that they try to modify. Um, and some other general things you can check. Everything is listed in the post. But basically, um, the most important thing is that if you hear about it and you are a user of social automation um, services, um, repositories, then you should check yourself. Go through what you, you have used, go through the repositories that you have cloned. Um, that would be the main audience that you need to hear that. And now if they do know they were infected, what they can do about it? And if Apiro has any tools that can help them? So post possible infection, the only thing you can do is remove any, not use any code that you've, you've downloaded with, um, without checking it and reinstalling the aforementioned applications. Also, you know, you can change all of your passwords and everything, yeah, because they've stolen cookies and credentials. So you can go that route. It's a lot of uh, work. It's a heavy burden to change everything. But if there's a chance of infection, then the risk is probably justifies it. probably justifies it. What can they do now to ensure that they will not once again fall victim to such repo confusion campaign in future? It comes back to the defense mechanisms that we've discussed. So first, it should uh, be around awareness because that's the best uh, we can do now because there is no solution now except for awareness. And again, using a service that scans your code for malicious code. But the service, well, existing services focus around code that you push into your repository. But here you have repositories that you might use as a developer for your, your independent workflow. So it won't help you in that case. You need something that scans all of the code that you use to avoid such, uh, such incidents. And of course, you know, malware detection products, but when it's code that you execute, then they do a much uh, lesser job. They're much less good at uh, finding these incidents when it's just code that you're running. And if the malware is written properly, um, it would be easy to avoid detection. Adan, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, this repo confusion campaign. Thanks also for sharing what steps organizations can take to, to, to ensure that doesn't happen in future. And I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Me too. I had a great time. Thank you very much, Swapnia. Hope to see you again soon.